Here amid the 3,000-year-old redwoods of California, scientists and dignitaries are burying a time capsule. At the base of these trees that have watched the rise and fall of many civilizations, these records of atomic progress will rest until the year 2446, 500 years from now. Here today are representatives of the three nations that made the major contributions to first harnessing atomic energy. The United States, the United Kingdom, and the Dominion of Canada. Major General Leslie R. Groves, Deputy Chief of Engineers. Beside him, Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer of the University of California, America's foremost nuclear physicist. Representing the United Kingdom and the Dominion of Canada at this ceremony are Dean Mackenzie of Canada, Dr. Chisholm of the British Scientific Mission, and C.D. Howe, Canadian Minister of Munitions. Dr. Vannevar Bush, Director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development. Dr. Enrico Fermi, Nobel Prize winner of the University of Chicago, and Admiral William S. Parsons, Bureau of Ordnance, United States Navy. These men of all countries and creeds lent their knowledge to solving the great problems of atomic energy. Among the many items and records sealed in the time capsule were a movie projector, with instructions for its use engraved on copper, and a print of the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer motion picture dramatization, the beginning or the end. A title expressing the fear of people today that a future atomic war may destroy all humanity. A message to future generations. Come what may, our civilization will have left an enduring record behind it. Ours will be no lost race. is J. Robert Oppenheimer. I'm an American scientist working in the year of our Lord, 1946. I'm addressing you people of the 25th century in English. Now, and I hope in your time, one of the leading languages of the world. I'm working in a physics laboratory, typical of many others, devoted to scientific research. In my lifetime, I saw the rise of the automobile, airplane, the radio, television, motion pictures, and a vast spread of knowledge. I believe, as do many others, that my age is the most enlightened in all history. And yet, during my lifetime, I have already seen two world wars. In them, 87 million men and women perished or were wounded. The people of my era unleashed the power which might, for all we know, will destroy human life on this earth. For you of the 25th century, we have recorded our search to unlock the atom. We know the beginning. Only you of tomorrow, if there is a tomorrow, can know the end. This story began just before World War II in German universities and laboratories. 
It is a foolish decision that you scientists must develop every type of radical and secret weapons at the earliest moment. The Führer will provide whatever you need. You must give all your minds and loyalty to this great effort. The Fatherland demands incessant work. The Führer must have such weapons before anyone else. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Let it go! Beyond the Western Seas, universities followed peaceful ways of study and play. But behind these scenes of athletics, some little people of science, no longer wanted by dictators, were tirelessly continuing their inquiries into nature's hidden laws. These refugees from religious and political persecution delve deep into the newest theories of the world's great physicists, enlisting the aid of brilliant young American students, such a student as Columbia's Matt Cochran. Dr. Fermi, Dr. Fermi, Dr. Murray, come quickly. Look, those big peaks are fishing, sir. Yes, such energy can only come from splitting the uranium atom. This confirms my cable from Europe. It confirms everything. Something else may take place. I couldn't sleep for thinking of it. Suppose we split one atom. It may give off other neutrons. Those neutrons split other atoms. A chain reaction. Yes. If true, we can change the world. All the power anyone can use every place. Not so fast. We are blind men reaching into the unknown. Atomic energy can become a terrible weapon of war. Look, we've all been educated to believe that science should help humanity, not destroy it. All the years of atomic research. Must they end up on a bomb? It's inevitable. So which end of the bomb do you want to be on? You realize what it will mean if Hitler succeeds before you do? But Dr. Fermi, you refuse to do such work in Italy. Yes. And here you offer to do it. There Mussolini demanded I do so. But here I would freely volunteer because I trust our motives. Yes, I see the difference. Well, I'll see you gentlemen in about a week. Oh, Matt. As we agreed. But you're not through yet. What's next? Do I wash the dishes or make the beds? <laughs> Look, my bride and I are going to Washington. We want to see the Lincoln Memorial. You're needed by Zanard and Wigner. They're making a very crucial experiment. Then you'll be there, Doctor. Mm -hmm. I have to make a talk to the Convention of Physicists tomorrow. I'm returning to Europe immediately. So you must be there while they're taking the next step. That's the nice thing about science. There's always another milestone. Well, I hope today's the day, Dr. Szilard. As soon as Wigner gets here, we will be ready to go. You will see a demonstration of one of the fundamental principles of science, the principle of maximum cussedness. <laughs> I knew cussedness worked in human beings. Does it work in physics, too? Now, we expect to find that splitting atoms of uranium will give off neutrons, making it possible to start a chain reaction and liberate atomic energy on an enormous scale. That follows. Mankind always uses energy for destruction. At first, anyway. So our experiment will work. And there is your fundamental principle of maximum cussedness. Matt? Dr. Fickner? Here's your radium. Now what's wrong? It must work. But it doesn't work. There are the notes.
gentlemen. The plugs. Two neutrons per fission. Two neutrons are more than enough. This is exceedingly serious. We must not talk about this outside here until we have had time to think it out. This is too big a responsibility for us, Leo. The president must be advised. He'll think we're crazy if we tell him what can result because we saw some lights on that screen. We don't carry enough weight. He would believe Einstein. He would listen to him. Good. Matt, you had better come along with us to Princeton. I was just married. Ann and I are trying to get away on our honeymoon tonight. You must come with us, Matt. Einstein will want to ask you some questions. He won't ask half the questions my bride will. <laughs> Shorty. Hey, what's wrong with you? I have to go to Princeton. I thought you were through with college. I have to work out a few equations for Einstein. I've heard of men running out in a marriage, but never a honeymoon. Duty calls, and how I hate it. Why can't I go along? What for? You never passed your algebra. When will you be back? Late tonight, I hope. I'll miss you. You better take in a show or something. I think I'll do the laundry. On this quiet campus, the world's greatest living scientist found refuge from religious persecution. Now I understand why you were so urgent. And you agree, Professor, the chain reaction can result in a bomb which might destroy all the world's people? It's possible. But we must remember that man has not been able to destroy even the insect pests. Such a bomb could kill millions of human beings in a single attack. I just received a letter from a friend abroad. I suppose you have heard Germany has stopped all exports of uranium. Then we've little time to lose. It's a race the United States hasn't even started yet. So you see why we must inform the president. And after all, Professor, it's all based on your theory of mass being energy and energy being mass. Come now. You can't attribute it all to my theory. Nuclear physics started with the discovery of radium by Madame Curie, a Pole. It was developed by Rutherford, an Englishman. Artificial radioactivity was discovered by Joliot, a Frenchman. Uranium was first bombarded with neutrons by Fermi, an Italian. The neutron itself was discovered by Chadwick, an Englishman. A cyclotron by Lawrence, an American. And the splitting of uranium was detected by Hahn, a German. Don't blame it all on me. Would it be possible for you to go and see President Roosevelt yourself? But I have a cold. And besides, I do not know Mr. Roosevelt very well. I'm sure the president knows you, sir. It will be more polite if I just write him a letter. Good. Thank you, sir. Now, how shall we begin? Stay near me and help me with my grammar and spelling. Make some notes, please. Dear Mr. Roosevelt, some recent work by Enrico Fermi and Davis. Before Einstein's letter reached President Roosevelt, Germany's march of conquest began. Hitler invaded and conquered country after country. It was lightning war. It seemed no one could stop him. The United States remained at peace. Universities and colleges throughout the nation steeped themselves in atomic research. 
our scientists, looking past the front lines, pushed forward in the race for knowledge. Compton at Chicago, Lawrence at California, Yuri at Columbia, Smythe at Princeton, Spedding at Iowa State, Bacher at Cornell, Near at Minnesota, Bright at Wisconsin. They contributed knowledge and resources to the gigantic battle to conquer the atom. On December the 7th, 1941, Japan attacked the United States. The war covered the world. One week later, a representative scientist, Dr. Vannevar Bush, had an appointment. Morning, Dr. Bush. Mr. Oye. Glad to see you again, Van. Mr. President. Sit down. Always a great honor, sir. In the last few months, you've caused me more sleepless nights than any individual since I've become president. <laughs> so far, Mr. President, I've only sent you a few brief messages. Well, I've brought you our complete report to date. Summing up the judgment of the National Academy's reviewing committee. <laughs> Is it favorable or unfavorable? Uh, we believe if pushed to the limit with money, materials, and resources, such a bomb can be in actuality. How long will it take? Uh, nobody knows. One of these bombs, atom bombs, I suppose you'd call them, could it be carried in a plane? We've no idea how large it would be. That's one of the things we must learn. What'll it cost? That's another serious problem. Cost at least. Yes. One billion dollars. That's a lot of money to ask Congress to appropriate. Even when they know what it's for. We hope to hold it down to a billion, which I realize is a lot of money. But we may as well face it, it's, it might cost... Yes? Two billion. Back in 39, the Navy put up some money as a starter. How much? <laughs> $6,000. We've since committed about 300,000. Well, that leaves quite a way to go, up to two billions. Congress would be justified in impeaching me if I spent that much money on a secret project that failed. Mr. President, the members of the National Academy of Science are the best this country can produce. They're sincere, brilliant men working for America. They feel we must go ahead. What immediate steps had been necessary? push the various scientific projects, uh, develop pilot plants, make plans for production, even if other war projects must be curtailed. And the Army should appoint an officer of engineers to coordinate all these activities. If we should get this bomb, will it be just another bomb or a decisive weapon? We feel it will be decisive. What about a supply of uranium? The largest available source is Canada. Well, that means asking Canada and Britain. Their scientists are also working on this problem, so their participation would be invaluable. Atomic energy on the loose could open the way for the destruction of all civilization. The perfection of atomic weapons is inevitable, if not by this country, then by some other. Have you any idea how far Hitler's scientists have progressed? We feel sure they're on the same track, probably ahead of us. I have prayed I'd never have to make this decision. Well, thank you for coming, Van. You and your colleagues have done a disagreeable duty well. I'll let you know. Thank you. Good day, Mr. President. Sit down, dear. Grace, you're a woman and you hate war as much as I do. If Hitler had a bomb that could wipe out a city like Washington in one shot, what would he do with it? He'd use it. A hacky? 
Get me Mr. Winston Churchill. Tonight. I hope Emmy and the baby got to shelter quickly. Telephone, Dr. Chisholm. Dr. Chisholm. Telephone. Oh, Chisholm here. Yes, certainly. Yes. This man never sleeps. Yes, Mr. Churchill. Oh, so so. The entire staff. Very well, we'll start immediately. Yes. <laughs> yes. Quite. Listen, everyone. The Prime Minister has ordered the whole kit and caboodle of us to America to combine our atomic efforts with theirs. December 42, Stag Field, Chicago. Now the Army is in it, in contact with every step taken by the men of science but keeping in the background for reasons of security. Metallurgical laboratory? Well, you'd hardly call it the uranium project for the development of the atomic bomb. <laughs> hardly. Thank you, sir. Just a moment, gentlemen. There's danger of deep burns and poisoning. These detectors help guard against it. Would you please give your names to the girl? Chisholm. Howe and Wyatt. Chisholm, Wyatt, Howe. Right to that door, please. Fermi! Dr. Chisholm! Hi. <laughs> Hello. Good to have you here. This is Dr. Wyatt. How do you do? C.D. Howe, Minister of Munitions for Canada. Dr. Compton. All right. Gentlemen. How are your tests progressing? Well, they've gone far enough to show us how difficult the whole project is. What about uranium? The Dominion government is pushing production to the limit. Well, Dr. Singh, call the staff, will you please, Wally? We'll start the full pile test at once. Things are looking up around here. We didn't dream you'd be ready so soon. Suppose we go in. Why, yes. This way. The man in the brown suit. Uh, Dr. Fermi. Yes? Uh, I'm Major Nixon. I'm the new assistant to the area engineer and uh, observer for the Army. Glad to see you. Thank you. Matt. He's up on the control rod. Hey, Matt. Take care of the Army for us, will you please? Thanks, Doctor. Matt Cartman. Jeff Nixon. You got here just in time for the fireworks. Oh, good. Say, uh, I'm uh, a little behind on Flash Gordon's latest. How about a quick briefing? Compared to what we're trying to do, Flash Gordon has a boy from the Stone Age. Oh, well, then I'm a prehistoric ape. <laughs> this deal runs like this. This is a hunk of pure uranium, refined from the crude ore of pitch blend. In it are many 238 atoms. How many? A hundred million to the inch. Cubic inch? Ordinary ruler inch. Oh. And a few 235 atoms. Did you ever see a tree hit by lightning split in two? Mm hmm. When a neutron hits a 235 atom, the atom splits, like that tree. It also sends out more neutrons, some of which hit other 235 atoms, and so on, resulting in a chain reaction. It's as if that tree were in a forest and sent out lightning when it split, splitting the other trees. Is that a fact? Uh, well, now, what happens to the rest of the atom family? Other neutrons hit U-238 atoms which do not split, and change them into a metal called plutonium, which we intend to use in the bomb. Oh, plutonium. Of course, we haven't any plutonium. Why not? There's never been any. It's a brand new element. Oh. The pile is an atom smasher, a stack of alternate graphite bricks and pure uranium to supply the neutrons to keep the chain reaction going and make plutonium. Roll a billiard ball on a table. It has only two other billiard balls on it, and it might not collide with them. Oh, well, that experience I've had. But fill the table with billiard balls, and one that rolls is sure to hit at least two more. 
The pile is our table filled with neutrons and atoms instead of billiard balls. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if this dream doesn't work? There won't be a plutonium bomb. Other scientists are trying to separate U-235 from uranium. If they succeed, we can get a bomb out of that. Supposing they flop? There won't be any bomb. <laughs> What's the joke? Well, I have to uh, try to make a report on this that my boss can understand. Well, we scientists stopped all publications on atomics long ago. I hope your report will be top secret. Well, I hope I'll have a top secret to report. It's ironic only a war could give us this chance. Most scientists really don't want to make a bomb. I thought a bomb was what this was all about. Well, what we discover should belong to the world, as much as a new medical discovery. Well, just get us that bomb, and get it before Hitler or the Japs. I often wonder if we should. Well, the way the war's been going against us, you'd better, and soon. You can do your wondering later. Well, that's our atomic billiard table. Now, the show doesn't really start until the pile reaches a size we call critical. Then it should start to multiply, if chain reaction really works. You mean chain reaction is only an idea, too? Oh, it's better than that. It's an unproved theory. The pile is controlled by those cadmium rods running through it. Until they're pulled out, they absorb neutrons greedily and keep the pile from running away and exploding. And if that theory doesn't work? Well, we may lose something. But like what? No, like Chicago. Of course, that really couldn't happen. <laughs> well, why, why didn't you move it out into the desert? Well, we intended to, but all our equipment's here and time is everything. Where's the service station? Well, if the pile gets out of control, they rush in and tear it apart. They're the suicide squad. Oh, uh, that's nice, pleasant work. Yeah, so sure to get a bad dose of radioactivity poisoning. Keep that right on there, George. Yes, sir. Hold this, please. We may need it. And don't drop it. Complete the last layer of bricks, please. Completed. Thank you. Should be critical. Testing stations, please. Uh, don't you have a job? I'm in charge of that vertical bar. My pals laughingly call it dead man's ride. If something goes wrong, they figure out keel over. Gravity will drop the bar into the pile and maybe save something. Like what? Like St. Louis. Remove the safety rods. Ease out the control rod. Out a little more, please. a little more, please. Out a little more, please. You must multiply. Move the rod out another foot. Change chamber from nine to ten. Out a little more. Out a little more, please.
Captain Morphy. message all prepared. Ahead of me, huh? How's this? <laughs> the Italian navigator has landed safely in the New World. And found the natives very friendly. Thank <laughs> you. Sure. Thank you. Did you see this, Doctor? <laughs> Why? Congratulations, gentlemen. Uh, how many atoms of plutonium did we make? Thousands of millions. No. Hitler, here we come. <laughs> Not yet. We've only taken the first step in a marathon race. This is only a test. Oh. To get enough plutonium to cover the head of a pin. We'd have to run this pile a million years. Oh, thank you, Major. I find we need this after all. Come on, help yourselves now. Let it flow, Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Yes, sir. Major! Matt. God give us time. And God forgive us. Dr. Fermi? Yes? My colleagues and I feel that this is now a munitions project. Our belief opposes violence in all forms. We would, therefore, like to resign. I hate to lose you, but I respect your scruples. Thank you for what you have done so far. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sometimes it takes greater principles to stay than to go. It's a free country. Yes, yes, it is. Doctor's office right away, Mr. Cochran. Thanks. Hello, stranger. Oh, Shorty, don't come near me. Try and stop me. Stop! Oh. I picked up some sort of radioactivity. Are you sure you're all right? No, it's nothing, but I'd better go back to the clinic. I'll wait right here. counter at the gate. Your pen shows overexposure to radioactivity, too. Oh. Shall we start the blood count, Doctor? Immediately. Get out of those clothes. Were you very
very close to the pile. Dead man's rod. Looking all around the pile. This could be very serious. Yes, Doctor. Blood count, please. Yes, sir. You'll have to report here daily for rechecks. The worst may not show up for weeks. Quite a menagerie here. Yes, testing for alpha ray cancer and similar diseases. To get enough for our work, we had to set up a chain reaction in mice. Oh. <laughs> this radium capsule was in the cup of his trousers. We thought that Frisker counter at the gate would keep an eye on you daydreamers. What do I do, go home in a sheet? You might have gone home under one. Good night, Mr. Cochran. Good night. Oh, are you all right? Perfect. Hey, what are you doing here? Oh, I tried to be a good girl, but I couldn't stay away any longer. It's telepathy. I know you've been working 24 hours a day and haven't any time, but I just had to see you. What about your job? Oh, I told them I needed a few days off. To chase down a man? Darling, what's wrong with you? You seem a million miles away and empty inside. I wish I could tell you, Cherie. Is it about your work? Mm-hmm. You could stop it and join the army. In many ways, the front lines would be easier. Oh, I hate to see you like this. Well, you just have to trust me. Let me work things out for myself. I'll trust you and love you. Darling, the problems you can't tell me, I still share. But if we mustn't talk about them, let's forget them. They're nicer things for the few moments we have. This above all, to thine own self be true. And it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. And you better not be false to me either. Morning, Shadow Groves. Morning. Nixon. Yes, sir? What are you doing here? I'm ordered to report to you, sir, as your assistant. Well, that's a pleasant surprise. I'll bet it is. Morning, Jim. Good morning, sir. I thought I'd get rid of you. Uh, that's hard to do, sir. Where have you been? Uh, well, different jobs. Hello, Dick. What do you do? Get those suckers. Stuck here for the duration, behind the desk. It's tough to train for war for 20 years, then not get to fight. Hard on the taxpayers, too. I bet the real reason you wangled this job with me is because you heard I was headed overseas. Oh, good. Oh, Dick. Good morning, General. Good morning, General Summer. How would you like the most important job in this war? Who wouldn't? See General Steyer in half an hour. You'll take charge of S-11. S-11? Seven come 11. Sounds like a lucky number. Before you're through with it, you'll wish you'd been born a girl, baby. S-11. It could have something to do with submarines. Submarines. <laughs> the only real job in this war is landing in France. Good morning, Miss O'Leary. Good morning, General. Colonel. Good morning, Dreamboat. Are you as sleepy as I am? The next time you keep me up till 3 a.m., I'll kill you. Well, I always say people should make the most of charming company, no matter what the time is. And you are charming. Ah, that's mighty sweet talk, Colonel. Well, we had to celebrate this new and exalted rank of mine, too. Which reminds me, where's my insignia? Oh. There you are. That's just so people will know who you belong to. Say, um, how about tonight? <laughs> you tempt me strangely, sir. But sorry, Jeff. To hit this job at 8 a.m., a girl needs most of her beauty rest. Maybe tomorrow. Uh, hadn't you heard? General Groves is headed overseas tomorrow. Oh, no, Jeff, you're not... not so soon. Yeah. I'm afraid this is it. Oh, I wish... Tonight? You bet. Colonel? You can spare a little time for military affairs. Come on, Bill. Tell us. What's the most important over?
overseas job in this war? Kidnapping Hitler? The most important job in this war is right here in Washington. Now, wait a minute. I'm a field soldier, and I've done my share of desk work. This job will make construction of a hundred training camps and this building seem like playing with baby's blocks. The president has signed a blank check for it. And I fill it in. No, thanks. If you take this job, you'll be doing everybody in Washington a favor. Why pick on me? You're the only officer in the Army who can think of spending a hundred million bucks without fainting. Of course, it won't be easy working with the best scientists in the country. Who's been running the show up till now? Briggs of the Bureau of Standards, Bush and Conant, the OSRD, other top men. Be like managing a three-ring circus with big corporations for elephants. What is it? Developing something to end this war. An atomic bomb. An atomic bomb? That's it. You should be proud they want you to do the job. I'd like to meet the guy that recommended me for it. What's been done so far? You can be brought up to date on the details by Colonel Nixon. So you know the details to date. Colonel? Yes, sir. S-11. Submarines? Well, that S really stood for security, General. I'm sorry, though, sir. I know how you feel. I had my heart set on overseas duty, too. Where do I pick up the blank check? Not here. This one is mine. It's for $2.63 for garden seeds. S-11. Chisholm, England. Thank you. Wyatt, England. Thank you. Keller, Chrysler Corporation. Bush, Office of Scientific Research and Development. Hello, Dr. Bush. Hello. Rafferty, Union Carbide. PC Chief, Kellogg's Corporation. Winnie, General Electric. Thank you. Carpenter, DuPont Company. you formally and officially the Espionage Act of this country. Whoever with the intent to use it to the injury of the United States communicates or attempts to communicate to any foreign government or any subject thereof information relating to the national defense in time of war should be punished by death or by imprisonment for not more than 30 years. Gentlemen, my commission required me to take an oath to defend the United States against all of its enemies, whomsoever. I'm sure each of you would be glad to do the same. We're here to discuss a matter of great importance. Those who remain will be bound by the Espionage Act. Anyone who wishes to leave the room may now do so. This is not Germany. I take it we understand each other. Our country must have an atomic bomb. It's your job and mine to get it. From today, the Army is in charge of this project. It will be mentioned only by its code name, Manhattan District. This must be the best kept secret in all history. Intelligence and security will be under Colonels Lansdale and Considine. They will investigate the background and connections of every man working on it, including myself. Everyone here has already been investigated or he wouldn't be in this room. I don't want to alarm you, but anyone who even knows about this may be in danger from enemy agents. From the time you leave here, you will constantly be under protective guard. That is only a minor phase of our work. Our men are with the European underground reporting locations of Nazi laboratories and so forth. 
The Germans are making atomic progress. Our bombers and the RAF will try to slow that down to get you the time you need. Our plants must process mountains of uranium ore to get mole hills of explosive material. The manpower and plants required make building the pyramid seem like child's play. We're still feeling our way stumbling along. There are many scientific problems yet unsolved. I'm counting on you scientists to solve them. A plutonium plant needs tons of pure graphite, power, cooling water, and it must be isolated. It may endanger a large area. We've decided to build that plant near Cooley Dam and cool it with the waters of the Columbia River. Code name, Site W. What about you, 235? We'll set up the two uranium factories and the plutonium pilot plant near TVA in Tennessee. Code name, Site X. Well, we need a laboratory and proving ground for this bomb, if we get one. <laughs> I don't believe I'll tell even you gentlemen where that will be. But you may refer to it as Site Y. This will be the biggest job ever undertaken by men, and it must be the fastest. We'll need many existing plants. You'll have to plan, design, build, and run many new ones. You represent our top corporations. Will you do the job? But there are many things to be considered. First, my company has had no experience in this type of work. No one has had any experience in this work. Overloaded with war contracts, our manpower is stretched to the breaking point. Mr. Carpenter, no part of this project will be easy. They've laid down a challenge. That's something American industry has always picked up. But how can we? Think quicker, work faster, drive harder. General Groves, my company will throw its resources wholeheartedly into this project with two stipulations. What are they? All patents must be assigned to the people of the United States and our total profit shall be one dollar. You've made a deal. We've named this place Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The plutonium pilot plant, Clinton Laboratories, goes over there. One uranium factory will go in that valley. The other goes beyond those hills. Imagine the industrial empire that'll feed material into this place. We'll put the intersection of Georgia and Tennessee Avenues right there. From a stick in the dust, a secret city rose. Forests were felled for homes, schools, hospitals. Thousands of tons of steel, millions of feet of lumber. And there was always security. Men and women, builders, mechanics, electricians, plumbers, carpenters not knowing what they were building because of security. Security wherever they were. Security at home. Security abroad. Secret. 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 From everywhere came scientists. From the laboratories, from industry, from the army, from colleges, from technical schools. For this was a young man's project. They knew why they were there, but they were silent. Because of security. Secret, secret, secret. A stick in the dust became the fifth largest city in a state. Working, working, working on mountains of pitch blend from Canada, refined into a tiny speck of something, which someday might change the course of the world. think we'll be here? A couple of centuries, I hope. End of the line. Shoes. And now, 
the mud. <laughs> Do we play hide and go seek or run, sheepy run? That isn't mud, Shorty. It's glue. Ah, much easier to wash your feet than clean your shoes. What, no piggyback? Come on. <laughs> Just testing. They come through every once in a while. Testing for what? You saw the sign back there. No questions. I feel like I'm married to Superman. Well, here it is. Oh, breathtaking. Home sweet home. Families with two kids get much larger quarters. Twins run in our family. Well, they got a time we'll save. General, come in, Rand. Pull up a chair, gentlemen. Well, Rand, what's on your mind? Process A is an absolute failure, General. We've no chance to make it work? I hate to say this, but we all agree it's no good. And we'll abandon it. But, General, we've already spent $20 million. Can't ride a dead horse. We put your people to work at the electromagnetic plant. That looks like a dead horse, too, General. What's wrong with it? We'll never get enough copper to wire those electromagnets. We've combed every source. Copper. Copper alloys. Nickel. Chrome. Silver. Silver. Silver's as good a conductor as copper. How much do you need? Six million pounds. Six? Six million pounds of silver. And that's a hundred million bucks. Another hundred million dollars. <laughs> Holy smoke. General, here's another one in your lap. There's not a mill in America that can roll three-inch stainless. Then build one. Yes, sir. We've been on the brink of failure too often to weaken now. Remy? More trouble? Dr. Compton sent Major Gregor down here. The chemists finally have a practical method for extracting plutonium from uranium. What? Don't tell me we've started to run in the stretch. <laughs> We're back in business. Mr. Carpenter of DuPont is here on an inspection trip. Ask him to step in right away, please. Well, Tom, about that silver. The Treasury. The Treasury Department has plenty of silver. I'll get them to lend us the six million pounds you need. I'll sign for it. I hope your credit is good, General. If they balk, I'll put it up to the White House. We won't even charge the Treasury Department for taking care of it. And we'll give it back to them when we're finished with it. Now, get your people to work. And yours. Right, General. Oh, oh Fermi. Yeah. Sit down, just a minute. Yeah. Mr. Carpenter, the chemists have finally licked plutonium extraction. You can go ahead with the Hanford plant. Well. What about moving the people who live in that area? It covers 700 square miles. That's your job, Jeff. Get those 18,000 people out of there. Locate them in new homes and make them happy, but don't tell them why. Yes, sir. Major Gregor and Cochran will go along to help. But... Yes? Well, get going. There's a plane waiting at the airport. Take off the second you get there. I'll wire Dr. Compton to meet you in Hampton. Yes, sir. I uh, take it Ann got in today. Half an hour ago. Oh, boy, you certainly have a beautiful home life. Touch and go. Just go. In the far northwest, thousands of families living on the plains, on ranches, in small towns, suddenly were asked to pull up stakes and move. So they left. With their children, with their cattle, with their family pets, with all their belongings. They would be given new homes, new lands. They were told only that their sacrifice would help win the war. So, without question, without protest, without even knowing that they were helping to fashion the greatest weapon of all the weapons of war, they left.
Hello, General. General, we must have 200 houses at once. 200 houses? What for? So that the 200 precision tool makers I need will have a place to live. After you get them for me. After I... 200 precision tool makers? There aren't that many in the country. Captain Parsons and I agree that to design and build a gadget, we need them immediately. I'll see what I can do. Thank you. Thank you. There's still a few details of design to work out. Uh, hello, Jeff. We've been expecting hello, you. Hello, Offie. Hey, Matt. You got hello, here. Matt. Hi, Parsons. Jeff. This is the first uranium-235 from Oak Ridge. Will you sign these papers, Offie? Oh, of course. I um, hope you know the combination. I don't. We counted on this arriving on February the 7th, so we made the combination 2745. Well, looks like America met a deadline. Two, and there's only seven, a few hundred more to meet. 45. We are. Thank you. First base. Joe, Ski, Matt, everybody, come here, will you please? Uranium 235. 235. Few men have ever seen it except through a microscope. Well, I hope its kick is bigger than its size. Millions of freight cars came into Oak Ridge, and it could be held with a pair of tweezers. July, eh? No, I've nothing more. Thank you, Steve. The German rockets are hitting England hard. What about Japan? Psychological warfare is convinced the Japs will fight right down to the women and children. Steve said something about July. They're testing the atomic bomb, then. At last. I'm sure it will work. All that effort must bring success. Our latest intelligence worries me. Considering the damage plane rockets do, it'll be murder if Hitler comes up with an atomic one. Sounds horrible. I'd better send a long memo to Vice President Truman to let him in on Manhattan District. I've written him enough short ones to keep out of it. <laughs> My dear Harry. The artist is ready, Mr. President. Remind me to finish that memo. One thing I'm sure of, our men are doing their best. If it works and we win the race, we'll be able to end the war. I hope so. There's, uh, there's an additional thought I want to incorporate in my Jefferson Day speech. Yes. We seek peace, enduring peace. More than an end to war, we want an end to the beginnings of all wars. Yes, an end to this brutal, inhuman, and thoroughly impractical method of settling the differences between governments. Yes. No more for him life's stormy conflicts, nor victory, nor defeat, no more time's dark events charging like ceaseless clouds across the sky.
Hello, General. Hello, Arthur. Barry. Hello. Jeff. General. Matt. I'm glad you could get here for the verdict. Thank you. General Farrell. How'd you do? Dr. Oppenheimer? Coffee. General Farrell will be in charge of field operations, if we have them. Right. Should we go ahead? Please. Good evening, General. Come on, man. Hello, Colonel. Hello, Good evening, sir. The bomb position here is called zero. These observation posts are south 10, west 10, and north 10. Each is 10,000 yards from the explosion, 5.7 miles. Complete recording instruments will be at Jumbo and at all observation points. Barometric observers will be here, 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 and here. All will measure the intensity of the explosion, if there is one. I understand I'm to be at base camp. Right. And General Farrell with you at control station. That's correct. These are concrete camera stations. The closest camera is six miles from zero. The explosion should produce a light unlike anything ever seen before, so do not look directly at the flash. Uh, further safety precautions will be broadcast later. Well, how about the people around here? This is a pretty desolate country. The nearest city is Albuquerque, 120 miles away. There is a small settlement here, 30 miles from zero. Their only danger is if radioactive dust should settle on them. If that appears probable, we plan to move them by truck. Suppose a dust drifts over us, General. Well, I don't know about you, but I intend to run. <laughs> well, boys, let's get to our posts and start assembling the first atomic bomb. I sure wish I could move. Me too. All right, boys, let's get to our stations. We'll clear this area except for the final party.
Okay, Jack. Okay. Can't help thinking, suppose this bomb sets off the oxygen and nitrogen atoms and starts a chain reaction in the air. Chances are less than one in a million. How fast would it travel? Thousands of miles a second. That means a chain reaction in the air would drown the world in a second or two. That's right. All set, sir. Well, this is it. Barrow, good luck. I'll be four miles further away. General, if air chain reaction happens, that won't be a safe margin. Check. And remember, you'll be in the open. This storm won't clear up for an hour, Doctor. Thank you. That's great. Be able to see or photograph much in this. We'll set a new zero hour. 5.30. Better get going. Go ahead, Dr. Wyatt. Attention all observers. At minus two minutes, all exposed personnel will lie on the ground. Eyes and face down. Head away from zero. It is now zero minus nine minutes. You must now apply sunburn lotion to face and hands. Put on your special glasses. You must at all times shield your eyes from the light of the explosion. It is now zero minus seven minutes. The hazard from injuries to the skin is best overcome by covering up. Use lotion freely. It is now zero minus five minutes. It is now zero minus two minutes. The sound will not reach you until seconds after the flash, depending on your distance from the tower. It is now zero minus one minute. Cut in the automatic control. It is now zero minus ten seconds. Nine seconds. Eight seconds. Seven seconds. Six seconds. Five. Four. Three. Two. One.
invasion. Head-on collision between two army bombers. Saw them plain as day. I saw it. They're coming. Come over the barn. Hit about ten miles from here. How did you survive today, little one? Did you wear dark glasses and put your feet towards a blast? You know, at first I thought the bomb might be terrible enough to make man choose between peace and destruction. Now I've seen it. I wish we hadn't made it. Robert, a lot of men not yet born will be grateful to you for this day. Thank you, Van. I hope they'll have reason to be grateful. We have unleashed a force that can be very good or very evil. All the energy of the universe, locked up since the beginning of time. Now we've finally turned the key. I wish President Roosevelt could have lived to have seen us. Yes. He would have been very happy to know that now it seems certain we can hurry the end of the war. Bobby, did you really have no worry how far this reaction might go? In my head, no. In my heart, yes. Yes. Mr. President, your press secretary, Mr. Ross, is here. Send him in, please. Mr. President, Charlie, I have just distributed to the press the text of the Potsdam Declaration, the ultimatum to Japan. What was their reaction? Great approval and some curiosity. Why curiosity? Why shouldn't we in Great Britain and China call on Japan for immediate surrender now that Germany's beaten? That last sentence, Mr. President. The alternative for Japan is prompt and utter destruction. That word prompt struck them. Some of the men seem to think that it means that uh, we have more B-29s than anybody knows. Some of the others think uh, we've got some mysterious new weapon. Those newspaper men are shrewd guessers. Sir? Sit down, Charlie. I want to tell you our nation's top secret. It must remain just that, top secret. Of course. We have developed the most fearful weapon ever forged by man, an atomic bomb. Even the word is frightening. It's been tested, and it works. It's a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. In peacetime, atomic energy could be used to bring about a golden age, such an age of prosperity and well-being as the world has never known. In war, this same energy has destructive power almost beyond the comprehension of man. It's clear now what the words prompt and utter destruction mean. Thank God we've got the bomb and not the Japanese. If they had it, they'd surely use it on us. That's one argument for our using it, Charlie, but it's not the decisive argument. The whole thing is terrifying. You must have spent many sleepless nights over it. I've consulted with Mr. Churchill, with all my top military and naval advisors. I've talked with the civilian heads of our war effort. And all these advisors tell me the bomb will shorten the war by at least a year. Where are we going to use it? That's another question I had to think about. The Army has selected several Japanese cities as prime military targets because of war industries or military installations or troop concentrations or fortifications. We are going to shower all these places for 10 days with leaflets telling the population to leave, telling them what's coming. And we hope these warnings will save lives. It should. And if the bomb shortens the war, it will save many thousands of American lives. 
A year less of war, Charlie, will mean life for 300,000, maybe a half a million of America's finest youth. Not only that, but it'll mean life for thousands of British, of Russians, of Chinese, of Japanese. These were the decisive considerations in my consent. As President of the United States, sir, you could make no other decision. As President, I could not. So I have told the Army to take the bomb to the Marianas, and when they receive the green light, to use it. meet here again. It's a promise. The four of us. First chance after the war is over. Pardon me. We're about ready for the takeoff, Colonel Nixon. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. You know, it's very funny. Every time we see each other, we're either saying hello or goodbye. When I get back, it's going to be hello for keeps. Oh, are we playing for keeps? Well, it's about time, isn't it? <laughs> could be. That is, if you promise to bring me back a grass skirt, could be. Oh, sure, bring you back a dozen grass skirts and a ukulele for myself. Don't uh, get too far away from that telephone, will you, baby? I'm allergic to don't answer signals. All you got to do, soldier, is dial, and when I hear your honeyed tones, I'll... Start baking your cake. Oh, no. Not that. <laughs> All right. I'll buy you one. Goodbye. So long. I hate to leave a cute gal like you on the loose. The big risk you're running, the farther away you go, the tighter you hold me. I can think of less painful ways of proving how we feel about each other. Parting is no sweet sorrow to me. It's just a pain in the neck. And such a cute neck. Hmm. You're a cute sort of a guy. You know, if I weren't married to you, I'd make an awful try to get you. I surrendered once, and for keeps. So long, Shorty. Happy landings. Take care of my wife for me. It's all right. How do you feel? Oh, uh, pretty good. I wish I did. Well, she'll be here when you get back, Matt. That's the only thing I'm sure of. The closer this stuff gets to its delivery point, the more my first thoughts come back to me. I can't help but wonder if we're right. So that's in again, huh? It isn't easy to kill thousands of people when all you really want to do is make it easier for millions to live. I like the way you dream. We're ready except for the cargo, Colonel. We're carrying the cargo. Why they want a physicist in the far Pacific, I'll never know. This war is full of secrets. I have a secret from him, too. I can't help wondering if it really will be twins. I wish I'd never heard of the Espionage Act. Hmm? Nothing. Another raid like that, and I'll really be flack happy. Another raid like that, and half Arnold can have my flying suit. Comfortable, boys? Don't you birds ever take the air? Quiet. Don't shout at our swivel chair heroes. Oh, look at that. What are you hiding in the building? Yeah. Geisha girls. What did you think? Well, I do declare, here comes the first team. Boys, why don't you get off your duffs? Are you on a sit-down strike? They're saving us for the junior prom, kids. <laughs> Colonel, may I have the first dance? Dear Rumba, oh, move on, boys. You're depreciating the value of our real estate. Jeff, Matt, Parsons, Tibbets. The weather looks good for the next three days. Headquarters has given us the green light. Oh, good. That's it. Our time is tomorrow, August 6th. I'll let you know exactly what time to start assembling the bomb. Right. Uh, you'll ride as observer for the Army. Thank you, sir. Parsons, you'll go along to check the release mechanism and the seeing eye for the Navy. All right, sir. 
And you and I stay here and bite our nails. Well, there have been several takeoff crack-ups lately. If that happens to us, we'll wipe out 40,000 American troops instead of our target. Well, that's a chance we have to take. Well, we could leave a few parts out of the assembled bomb, and I could put them in place after the takeoff. Well, I know enough to help. If you think it best, sir, I'd be glad to go along. Thanks. I don't believe we should send a civilian on a combat mission. Their scheme's a good one if they can learn the job in time. Do what you can. Check. Remember, in the plane, you'll have to fit that bowl into place. Insert the two lock pins. Make four connections. One. Two. Three. Four. It's like separating salt from pepper with boxing gloves. As you work, make sure the parts of explosive material, which will be down there, never come together. It'll be curtains, but quick. How does this look, teacher? Got it. One, two, three, four. I'm going to carry that in my lap on the takeoff. It's in your laps, all right. Uh, is it U-235 or plutonium? Only a few people know that. They won't tell. Well, I'm sure it won't make any difference to the Japs anyway. Uh, briefing at midnight. Come on, fellas. You won't need me, sir. I'll stay and work on the bomb. In order to uh, decrease chances of interception, only three planes will be used, no fighter escort. The Japs may assume we're weather planes or leaflet droppers. Jap collision flyers will not be healthy for the bomb-carrying plane or any plane near it. The two extra B-29s carry observers, equipment for measuring the blast, and photographers. Do not fly straight after release. The blast will blow you to bits. The shock wave will be rough. Make your turn and get out of there. Under no circumstances fly through the smoke from the explosion. It's sure death. Now, this mission climax is a year's training, during which you blindly obeyed orders and said nothing. This is about what you'll see tomorrow. All right, run it. Assembly time is 0300. Takeoff time 0345. That's it. It's a wonder the whole place didn't go up. Maybe this is what I get for helping build that thing. Come on, Matt. Sergeant, ask Captain Parsons to take over. Yes, sir. How much 
want you to promise me to see him. Of course I'll see him. Oh, you're a lucky guy, Jeff. Give her this letter. Be sure she gets it. There are things that I've been wanting to say to her for a long time. Important things. Things I couldn't say before because of secrecy. I wasn't sure how I really felt. Cochran has a very bad hand, Doctor. He burned it working on the bomb. Severe neutron exposure. Not radioactivity burns. Direct contact. Reaction beginning to set in. bow our heads. O Lord of hosts, show thy gracious love and care to those who fly this night. Bear them up in thy wings as thou hast thy hosts of old. Give them strength and courage. Keep them safe in body and soul and bring them safely home again. May they know thou art with them as they walk through their valley of death. May they know that all of us are in thy care now and forever. To the glory of thy name to the coming of peace upon the earth again. Amen. Amen. Send the usual cable, please. I think I ought to tell his wife about it myself. I'll arrange that. Better take care of this till I get back. Good luck, Jeff. Thank you, sir. Good luck, Parsons. Ready to start engines. Ready, sir. Starting number one. Starting one, sir. Starting number four. Starting four, sir. Airspeed 95. Airspeed 
Well, it's a new sort of metal. Sergeant? Yes, sir. As you've been briefed, when we start working on the bomb, watch that counter. Yes, sir. Remember, don't take your eyes off it until we have dropped the bomb. Yes, sir. If the red light starts flashing, brother, you start yelling and we'll kick that bomb overboard fast. Yes, sir. Don't worry about me. I'll start yelling. I won't hold back. Still working on it, sir. They say it's so cold up here the parts don't fit. Navigator to pilot. We're 75 miles out, sir. Roger, 75 miles out. Radio silence. Roger, sir. Long boy, calling long boy. What was the rest of that message? Yes, General. Why don't you go home? Why don't you? 
General. Radio operator to pilot. Our weather scout plane reports Hiroshima visibility unlimited. Roger, Dodger. Climbing for altitude, check your oxygen masks and cabin pressures. 2,443. Roger, sir. Close your pressure doors. Hiroshima on the button at 8.15. Pilot to crew, grease your faces, put on your special goggles. ETA 0815. Six. Fifty thousand people down there starting the day. A city about the size of Dallas, Texas. In about one second they'll be wiped off the map. They'll never know what hit them. We've been dropping warning leaflets on them for ten days now. That's ten days more warning than they gave us at Pearl Harbor. On target. Bomb doors coming open. Bomb bay doors open.
understand what Matt feared. If ever there is another war, it won't be cities burning themselves one at a time, but the whole world on fire, eating itself to ashes. Let's get out of here. I feel like we're over a dead world. Shima destroyed at 0815. En route, Tinian. Here it is, sir. Line five, color red. Line one, color green. Hey! What happened? What is it? What's it it worked. It worked perfectly. Three years' work by a million people. Day and night. Worry and sweat. At last. Gene, are you sure Matt's on the plane? I only know that Jeff's name was on the passenger list and one civilian. It must be Matt, darling. Oh, I hope so. Hello, General. Jeff. You did a fine job out there, Jeff. Thank you. I brought you a couple of chickens for dinner. Well, full colonel, huh? That's a lot of rank. You've earned it. I don't envy you the job ahead. I'm sorry, Ann. You better get her out of here. Use my car. Thank you, General. Something terrible to tell me. That's why you brought me here. Sit down, Annie. Something happened while Matt was working on the bomb. He saved it from going off. 40,000 Americans are alive on Tinian today because of Matt. But he isn't. You may want to wait until you get home. No. I... It should be ready. Right here. of you to keep me from knowing about our baby. So I wouldn't worry while I was in the Pacific. You should learn not to talk in your sleep. You'll be a fine boy, Anne. Gentle and kind and full of health. 
please keep me from spoiling him. By the time you read this, Hiroshima will have told you why I went to the Pacific. I know you'll be shocked when you learn about the bomb. From the first, I've had my doubts whether man could ever learn to use this terrifying force for good instead of evil. The dark threat of future atomic war, which can destroy civilization unless men learn to live together. This struggle with myself has made me write this letter, which is the voice of my conscience. We stand now where the early savages stood, when they ceased running away from fire and began to use it well. If those primitives learn to use fire, we of an enlightened century can learn to use atomic energy constructively. God has not shown us a new way to destroy ourselves. Atomic energy is the hand he has extended to lift us from the ruins of war and lighten the burdens of peace. And you and our boy will see the day when the atoms in a cup of water will heat and light your home. When the power on a pasteboard railroad ticket will drive trains across great continents. When the energy in a blade of grass will send planes to distant lands. We have found a path so filled with promise that when we walk down it, we will know that everything that went before the discovery of atomic energy was the dark ages. In the past, man has sought useless war, hunger and pain, has often been vile. Yet stubbornly, he has stumbled out of the chaos, lifted his eyes and gone on to make a better world. Now in the gravest hour of life on earth, he has found the secret of the power of the universe. You, the giver of a new life, must know that what we've unleashed is not the end. With all my love, I tell you this, Shorty. Men will learn to use this new knowledge well. They won't fail. For this is the timeless moment that gives us all a chance to prove Human beings are made in the image and likeness of God.